start in five, four, three, two, one. Start. Thank you. Warm welcome to the forty-fourth webinar of the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India. The topic of today's webinar is challenges in the management of simple bone cyst. I am sure that at the end of the webinar, you will realize that though it's called simple bone cyst, the management is not simple. There are so many challenges, so many difficulties, and that we are going to understand and discuss in today's meeting. We are really fortunate to have five experts. The two experts, that's Professor Fritz Zapti and Andreas Craig, they are from Switzerland. Professor James is again an expert on the topic and he's from Canada. And two experts, Manish and Hitesh, they are from India. Let's have a brief background about our expert panel. Professor Fritz Hapti was chief of the pediatric orthopedic at uh, University Hospital of uh, both Basel. Since 2010, he is senior consultant at that hospital. At present, he is one of the two chief editor of Journal of Children's Orthopedic. He is also a director of International Hip Dysplasia Institute. And his area of interest are pediatric hip tumors and congenital deformities. His biggest contribution to the field of pediatric orthopedic is his wonderful textbook, which is co-authored by uh, his team members from the same department. And I would suggest you to read it because it has so many pulse of wisdom in that and so many personal experience are shared in that book that gives us uh, so much experience and wisdom while we are reading that book. The another versatile personality is Professor James Wright. At present, he is Chief of Economics, Policy and Research at Ontario Medical Association. Before joining this post, he was Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at Oxford. And before that, he was Surgeon-in-Chief at Sikkid Hospital, Toronto. So he has a versatile experience starting from orthopedics to leadership, to the research. So I'm sure that his insight about this problem is going to be a great help to us. The another young person is Andreas Craig. He's a consultant at University Children's Hospital of both Basel, Switzerland. He's co-head of oncology team at the same hospital. His area of research are multimodal imaging, where he tries to combine MRI, CT scan, PET scan information one over the other so that the clinician can get better information and custom-made biological implants. The Manish Agrawal is the first dedicated ortho-oncologist in India. He served at Tata Cancer Hospital for 10 years and at present he is working at Hinduja Hospital and soon he is going to join Naravati Max Institute of Cancer Care. In in addition to the routine practice which everyone does, he runs a support group for sarcoma patient, which is a spandan, a social support group for the sarcoma patient. The Hitesh Shah is head of the pediatric orthopedic service at Kasturba Medical College, Manipal. Hitesh has a wide area of interest in parthes, osteogenesis imperfecta, congenital pseudoarthrosis of tibia, club foot, cerebral palsy, DDH. And over and above that, at present, he is a treasurer of Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India. If you have any question, you can send your questions to Sandeep on the mobile number 98250-32523. I just repeat 98250-32523. Before I hand over to Professor Hepti for the moderating the session, just a last two words about the upcoming webinars. We have a leadership development session on the 17th September. And the next month, we have a surgical session on how to do it session. And on that, we have facial bar excision as a topic. So please attend these sessions. I'm sure that is going to give us a different flavor to our clinical practice. So with that, I hand over to Professor Hepti for conducting the session and moderating the session. Over to you. Yes. Yes, welcome everybody. 
it's an honor for me to uh, moderate this session, which goes over the oceans and uh, is on, in all parts of the, of the world. And um, as uh, Dion said, we are not speaking about a simple subject. It's just called simple bone cyst. But it's very controversial, even if it's not a not a serious disease. Uh, there uh, is is a lot of controversy about uh, the treatment or non-treatment of this disease, and uh, this is what we want to speak about the next ninety minutes. And we start the session with uh, Andy Krieg. Uh, he will give an overview. Of, of, on the disease, he will speak about diagnosis, management options, and complication risks of simple bone cyst. Please, Andy. Yes, I open it up. I hope you can see yes. my file. Thank you very much. Also from my side, thanks to be a part. It's a great pleasure to be a part for this session. Um, and I try to give an overview about the simple bone cyst in diagnosis management options and complication risk. Um, short disclaimer. Oh, doesn't, ah, here we go. So at the moment I have no current conflict, but in the past I was paid for presentations for different companies relating of bone cement. However, my boss doesn't like the abbreviations. I like to uh, announce these short abbreviations, which are normally common and very well known. So speaking about a simple bone cyst based on the newest WHO bone tumor classification from 2020, when a simple bone cyst belongs to the group of other mesenchymal tumors of bone, benign, and represents about 3% of all benign bone tumors. All lesions previously listed under tumors of undefined neoplastic nature as the simple bone cyst are now considered true neoplasms in which recurrent translocations evolving the NFATC2 gene, the significance of which is not yet understood, have been detected just this year. High levels of oxygen-free radicals, interleukin-1, and an increased lysosomal enzyme activity have been found in simple bone cyst. And this may play a pathological role in bone damage, expanding the cyst, and increasing the pressure inside the cyst. Also still stated in the literature, um, most current textbooks, um, it is not able to detect any evidence of fibrin as a component of the respective matrix deposits that seem to consist predominantly of collagen and decorin, which was described by our Basler, Basler pathology group of Professor Baumherr and Jund. So the exact etiology remains elusive of the simple bone cyst. Also many theories have been proposed such as a blockage of the drainage system of interstitial fluid and venous obstruction within the bone. Bone cysts are more common found in boys and usually develop in the metaphyses of the long bones and may rarely cross the growth plate extending into the epiphysis. The cyst crossing the growth plate may induce growth disorder and with that limb length discrepancy or axial deviation, either spontaneously um, or as a complication of treatment can occur. Natural history of simple bone cysts develops in the metaphyses of the long bone. Then with growth migrates toward the diaphysis and usually end upfilled and ossified. Simple bone cysts are rare in adults, suggesting spontaneous resolution. But however, in my experience, I have seen about 15% of bone cysts or residual zone cysts in the adult patients. This can be considered to be in a latent or active phase based on the proximity to the growth plate. A cyst that is juxtafusial under half a centimeter from the physis is considered active. A cyst that has grown away from the blade is considered latent. There's no particular tendency to malign malignant transformation. I found only a case report with histology proven chondrosarcoma was described by the North American group under Mencken. I think there's another paper which describes it also, but this was not proved in all cases histologically. So 
the patients with simple bone cysts usually present with a pathological fracture or rarely on pain. Some patients with simple bone cysts are asymptomatic and in discovered incidentally. Simple bone cysts are important and often you can diagnose and diagnosis will find in the normal x-rays. However, they are described and located in the metaphyses of the long bones are juxtafusal, ratiotransparent, moderately expansive, well-contoured, centered up long along the longitudinal axis of the bone, usually unicameral with finely bony margins and thinning of the facing cortical bone. In fractures, they may be they may be sh um, small, sh show a small fallen fragment that has migrated via the intracystic fluid. This fallen fragment sign is considered by some to be pat patognomic. Actually, you found it in 20% of the fractures. I show beside the simple bone cyst x-rays uh, the important and most difficult differential diagnosis. The IBC anosmal bone cyst shows an eccentric, osteolytic, more expensive and sometimes tropical lesion containing fine, walled cystic cavities. Internal contours are well-defined with or without an osteostatal ring and the cortical bone bulges, quite bulges more than in the simple bone cyst. Loss of cortical contours or extension into soft tissue may be mimic a malignant lesion, indicating a very aggressive form. So X-ray often fail to establish the diagnosis and complementary imaging is required. So in the simple bone cyst, magnetic resonance imaging can confirm the cystic nature of the lesion by showing electric signal. The fluid level is rarely found. The periphery and any septima show enhancement on gadolinium injection. Fractured simple bone cysts may contain fluid levels and show nodular-like enhancement. Particularly the anosmal bone cyst MRI is the examination of choice to complement the X-rays. The typical aspect is an expansive lesion, lobular of septa. Multiple fluid levels may be detected on two-way T2-rated extra sequences at rest. While not specific, they are highly suggestive. Gadolinium injection shows enhancement of the cyst walls in internal septal. Primary ABC may contain a solid tissue component, also suggesting teleangiectic osteosarcoma or secondary ABC. Therefore, it is important that an anosmal bone cyst has to, be bio, has to be confirmed by biopsy. So it is sometimes really important also to differentiate these both tumors because simple anosmal bone cyst seems to be have an effect at similar population or cure at similar locations and might show similar clinical and radiological aspects. Differentiation can be careful, but is absolutely necessary for adequate treatment and follow-up. So biopsy could be possible for a suspicious of an ABC, not when you are sure with your simple bone cyst. Um, in use, sometimes in biomechanical different regions, CT scan can also help me for to get an ideal volume measurement, to get an idea about the, the thickness of the cortical wall, how many chambers and wall quantity is there. And of course, in conclusion with this study, the quantitative CT may be the most accurate method of predicting fracture, but even this method has false positives and false negatives in this study and thus involve risks associated with ionizing radiation. So that brings up the further diagnostic outcome parameters. Kaylin and McEwen found that the larger the cyst, the more cortex was destroyed and the bone weakened to quantify the strength of the remaining cortex, which is related to the size of the cyst and the size of the involved bone, they devised the cyst index. This gives the proportion between the radiographic area of the cyst and the size of the involved bone measured as the diameter of the diaphysis is squared. So a low cyst index indicates a small cyst area in relation to the bone. Conversely, a higher index indicates a large cyst. The humeral index is higher because these fractures occurred later than those in the lower limb because of the biomechanical reasons. One significant weakness of the study was the short follow-up of 1.4 years. And a recent study questioned the reliability of the cyst index. However, for me, it is a good predictor for fracture as well with my own experience and gives some, some ideas how really risky it is at the moment. And it's very quick and doesn't need any other 
examinations. So for my side, I had a good experience with that index. So here also is our, um, the measure the radiological outcome parameters after treatment, the near classification or the reverse near classification can be used and is most common. So outcome parameters could be the complete healing, say grade four, could be a partial response, filling of the cyst by new bone and cortical whiteness, and you still have a static reduction area under 50%. The next step or crate is then the persistent cyst with a radiolucent area over 50%. And finally, the recurrent cyst, which reappeared, and you have a residual radiolucent area increased in size. Here, I want to show you our indications in Basel, what we do with the different cysts and modalities. So we do no or conservative therapy when we have an internal finding without high fracture risk. Non-dislocated fractures at the upper limb could be treated with a conservative uh, regime and with a wait and see. However, we know, and from the literature, they have a high risk for relapse. So normally five to 15% of the fractures heal spontaneously. So surgery, it's important in the issue of the child's psychosurgical attitude to treatments and activity restrictions. If you find painful lesions, maybe they have already micro fractures. If you find a high fracture risk, so I still use the cyst index, of course, a relapse after fracture and a dislocated pathological fracture. Don't underestimate the fractures and the traumatization in body and in the psyche of the kid. Our primary goal of the treatment, operative treatment is to get stable conditions and prevent the fractures. Here's a 10 year old soccer player, percutaneous cyst aspiration and refilling with bioresorbable bone cement and uh, without problems and very nice healing after the treatment. You can imagine that with this huge of cyst, the net, next kick on his malleus lateralis will be fractured. So we usually go, I want to present you now our operative technique in Basel. We usually do a percutaneous aspiration of the cyst, fluoroscopically controlled via two percutaneous trocar needles. Then injection of contrast medium, like we do a cystography. And when we see walls or we have a CD scan, which we are aware of big walls, we use a flexible wire with a diameter of 0 0.8 or one millimeter to disturb or destruct these walls. After this, we do a lavage with hydrogen peroxide, fluoroscopic controlled via two percutaneous trocar needles. Why two percutaneous trocar needles? You see here in the cystogram, in this case, uh, appears two veins. And that was interesting to see this here, the, the technique with the lavage. And then it was pointed out by Ramirez at the colleagues, which showed that a negative venocystogram um, may achieve complete healing comparison to this that tend to show with a rapid venous outflow as it, in this case I showed in our case. So also it is important to know when you introduce therapeutic material and you know there are two or three veins connected, you probably slowly introduce your medication and use a second tracker trocar to show to, to increase the risk of migration in cyst with communication with the venous system as he showed here with the only partial response when you found the positive venogram after three injections. So keeping starting with the preparation of the cement and then injection of bioresorbable bone cement controlled via two percutaneous trocar, only when the cement started to harden, then I applicate the cement to make sure I don't get the cement in the veins. One closure of the incision with intracutaneous resorbable sutures and then the operation should be fine. So this is the case I showed you. And actually, as you see, four months postoperatively, we still have a radiolucent area, but probably better thickening of the periosteum. And we will see how it goes. However, he's playing football again after six weeks. Justin Hind, from my side, 
uh, in regard of trocars. I usually use uh, the cheapest one, which is an able. If you want to save your money, you can use the castroscopic trocars of your visceral surgeons, but maybe they would be not your friends anymore when they do the next gastroscopic or laparoscopy and find the cement in their gastroscopic trocars. So these are the options you can use different trocars and uh, to probably save money. However, the postoperative treatment plan, I usually don't restrict them in movements in upper and lower extremity humerus, no full contact sports for three weeks, and femur and calcaneus should do a partial weight bearing for four to six weeks, depending on the osteosynthesis and the age of the patient. Ideological and clinical concerns after six weeks, three months, and one year postoperatively, annually until healing of the cyst or completion of the growth. So we was wondering how we can really prevent fractures with our resorbable bone cement, radiological healing rates, and how is it with the resorption? As you can see here, case looks nice, looks stable, but however, it doesn't resorb. So how is it going with the biological resorbable bone cement? So we had involved three clinics in Switzerland, 38 patients, and we did an analysis of radiological healing, activity level, refraction recurrence rate, and resorption rates. And finally, we, we found refracture rates in both cements, all in proximal femur. And I can tell you that was because starting with cement, I was thinking, yeah, it's stable enough. I don't need any additional. Then I getting really after the second fracture uh, more wise and did additional stabilization. And the same with the new cement then we used. Also, first we had uh, two fractures here, proximal and proximal humerus. But in the proximal femur, we start then after the first fracture to stabilize again. Recurrence rate, a little bit higher here, doesn't matter in regard of the cement. Also, the full activity comes back after four to six weeks in most of the patients. But no resorption was seen in the bioresorbal bone cement of the tree calcium sulfate. During this is also calcium sulfate. However, with the bone cements, it's a minimal invasive, easy technique. Bone cement systems seems to be lower and comparable recurrence rate in comparison to the other techniques can provide stability and prevent refracture at the upper extremity and ankles. For the proximal femur, additional stabilization is necessary because of biomechanical causes. Otherwise, you have higher refracture rates. However, bioresorbable bone cements are very expensive. So seeing the aim of this quantitative systemic review was to assess the effectiveness of different simple bone cyst treatment modalities. They included studies needed to have a minimum sample size of 15 patients and have provided data on radiographic healing outcome. No really level of evidence was required and therefore due to the heterogeneity of the studies in reporting bias, the interpretation of these findings should be handled with caution. However, it looks, it seems to be that active treatment genes are superior to conservative treatment. The only study I'm aware of it with a high level of evidence is the study of Jim Wright and his group. Uh, it was a multi-center study also, I think, with Indian hospitals. Also, the rate of healing of simple bone cysts was low following injection of either bone marrow or prednisolone. The latter provided superior healing rates. And it's interesting to see that they also, it's a very nice study where they also looked to the function and the pain number of injections, additional fractures and complications. But between the treatment groups, there was no significant difference. And however, thinking about healing rates and true recurrence, I was aware of that study from the Vienna group uh, who really find a real recurrence rate because of the follow idea. So if I cut the whole bone out or I do aggressively curatage, and then we have a reappearance. So in solitary bone cyst, the reappearance of the cystic lesion is equated to a true recurrence. So they confirm the true recurrence rate for the solitary bone cyst after curatage and consecutive bone crafting about over 20% within the first 36 months after surgery. However, when we speak about complications of simple bone cysts, or we speak about complications in treatment and in surgery, we speak about a pathological fracture because this is more of a main cause of leg shortening, malalignment, of course, also of femoral head necrosis. 
But however, with the surgery, we increase also our complication rate. And here we have a case series of four or five patients. They showed that four patients with aspiration and corticoid injections, they had four patients with two or more fractures and the lag length is to be of four, more than four centimeters. So the question is if really the simple bones is cause the lag length discrepancy or maybe the treatment, or if you can see the high rate of fractures, probably the fractures. However, you can see here an impressive case of this study where you see really the growth arrest and it ends in a significant lag length discrepancy of 6.5 centimeters of this young fellow. When we speak about a mal alignment, I have uh, uh, own experience. I got a case from the surgeons when they fixed this pathological fracture, subtrahanteric. They did quite well, stabilized it with the brevet nails. However, as you can see, they had a significant retrotorsion on his right femur and he was symptomatic. So we have to do a derotational. Uh, osteotomy to get the rotation right, and the patient was after that pain free. The cyst wasn't a problem anymore. And another very important issue came up with the femoral head necrosis, but I actually didn't find any picture um, caused femoral head necrosis by a simple bone cyst in the literature. Of course, we are all aware about the medial neck fractures that cause of course, the femoral head necrosis, but actually in the literature, I didn't find any picture or clearer report about that. However, embolism, just in this year, came two papers up with a uh, um, vascular extravasation. Maybe it's important that there was also a an, an, uh, report, but unfortunately, it was only in Korean. So my Korean is not very good and I really not understand but it seems to be the first report they described the fatal pulmonary embolism after percutaneous cyst aspiration and refilling with autologous marrow. But just after that, two years later, they already evaluated with the Doppler that what happened under the simple bone cyst injections. And you see in this case, five of seven patients injections were not to have a large rapid outflow venous solid bone cyst. So the Doppler showed increased signal in all seven particular injections. And here are one marrow injection at the pelvis resulted in a transient bradycardia and decreased blood pressure with no luckily sequelae. Also one developed transient decrease in exhaled CO2. Oh, I apologize that. And but the first then case report on 21 gave recommendations because they visualized also a problem, not a huge problem. And so they gave some recommendations when you do cyst aspiration and put medications in. So probably mixing the cement or the medication not injecting before the cement is hardened. Using fluoroscopy to actively visualize the injection process, look for any extravasation of cement. Before injection, the anesthesia team should be notified to look for any acute changes in vital signs. If any cement leakage is seen on fluoroscopy or if the patient experiences acute changes in vital signs, the procedure should be aborted. Post-injection, imagine of the extremities mandatory to confirm that. However, I can tell you, I had my own big complication, but it was in a prone position of a young girl with an anosmal bone cyst, where we did a cyst aspiration, washed out with hyperexcision, and filled it up with bone cement. And actually, she felt in a very severe pulmonary complication. And we have to bring her intensive care. She was intubated. And as you can see, really, it was uh, uh, severe. We published that. However, she improved after four, 24 hours, eventually to full recovery. And incident was caused by gas embolization, pulmonary endothelial damage by uh, hyperoxygen. So I really come to the conclusions. Simple bone cyst is a benign neoplasm, can resolve spontaneously with maturity. Think about the uh, uh, pathological aspects. Walls are not in with fibrin, there are collagen in there. And we were looking forward to what's really going on with the detection of the translocation evolving NFATC gene. 
So the site is usually the long bone metaphysis on the primary the proximal humerus and proximal femur. The differential diagnosis has to be excluded, the anosmal bone cyst, and fracture does not heal a simple bone cyst. Treatment goals should be provide stability and prevent re or fractures back to normal life. And the recurrence is a second priority for me. So intervention is superior to observation in healing a simple bone cyst. Minimal invasive methods should be preferred at the upper extremity without stabilization at the proximal femur may, should be additional stabilization required because of the biomechanical causes. And aspiration and synthetic calcium sulfate, triphosphate, whatever you have in spiral cements seems equal, superior to all other interventions. There's still the evidence missing, but remember the recommendations and the possible complication. However, simple bone cyst does not take it please too simple. There's a high risk of trauma for bone and the psyche which is related to the activity restrictions. And we speak about kids still if it is a benign lesion. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Andreas. I think that was a good overview. Uh, we are a Thank bit you. advanced, so I think we go on with the first talk of Jim Wright, uh, which is on inter reliability and radiographic assessment of simple bone cysts. Please, Jim. Thanks, thanks so much. It's very kind of you to invite me today. This is the second uh, opportunity I've had to speak through these webinars, and it's been um, really, really very enjoyable. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, two papers uh, published in the Journal of uh, Children's Orthopedics, and they are uh, very much research-focused, and they're interrelated. One talks about the reliability of the radiographic measures, uh, many of which you heard about in Andreas' talk. And the second is about the functional implications of simple bone cysts. So one's what we measure, and the second is how we evaluate, um, at least in terms of reliability. But I'm going to start uh, perhaps with some really broad, you might even say self-evident concepts that place simple bone cysts into the broad treatment framework uh, for orthopedics. I'll then talk a little bit about the research we did, but I do want to end with some practical uh, conclusions um, as well. So, um, always a question about progression. There we go. So, this may seem a pretty obvious uh, um, point to you, but why, why do we do orthopedic surgery? What, what, what are we looking to do? Well, at least Andreas, um, his job is prolonging life. Uh, many times we're trying to improve function, particularly in adult orthopedics, uh, both adult and pediatric orthopedics for restoring function. And um, something that in pediatric orthopedics we do all the time is preventing future decline. So this obviously is a osteosarcoma. So in this case, orthopedic surgery is um, to treat this and uh, prolong this child's life. This comes from adult orthopedics, but here, uh, because of late stage degenerative hip arthritis, you have someone who's severely disabled in pain. So in this case, we're restoring function. We're trying to bring them back to a point before this decline happened. This is something we see all the time where this child prior to this fracture probably was functioning completely normally. But because of this fracture, they've had an immediate and severe restriction, at least in their upper extremity function. So the aim of surgery here, or the aim of treatment, is to restore function, to get it, um, uh, to get it back. And then finally, in pediatric orthopedics, a lot of time, as in this case of bilateral dislocated hips, we treat a child uh, who uh, has no symptoms, completely asymptomatic. But of course, we know without treatment, uh, that this almost certainly will develop arthritis. So treatment is to prevent some future event, which in this case may not happen for 20, 30, or even 40 years. So why do we measure things in orthopedics? Well, I've just told you some outcomes. We might want to measure uh, function. We might want to measure pain. We might want to mention, in some cases, survival. But of course, we also want to diagnose. Frequently in orthopedic surgery, we look at radiographs, CTs, or MRs, and Andreas took you through some nice differentiation, the two most common things, which are 
difficult. Uh, uh, the differential is a simple bone cyst, unicameral bone cyst or an aneurysmal bone cyst. And then prognosis. And he also talked about this. When we look at an X-ray or radiograph or a CT scan, can it help us predict, is this gonna cyst gonna heal or is it gonna fracture? So why do we care about simple bone cysts? Well, I, I think probably the most important thing is this risk of repeated fracture. This is very disruptive uh, for children and families. If this thing keeps fracturing at some frequency every year or every other year. Some have pain and I will show you that it's actually pretty small, uh, but as was said, this is probably microfracture. These are undisplaced uh, fractures through very thin bone that cause episodes of pain. Children are often restricted in their activity. So now we're talking about function. In some cases, this is the physician or the coach may say, you're not allowed to participate. Patients or families may also self-restrict because they don't want these fractures. And this is particularly important in children. Something we tend not to think about in children, but these children are otherwise normal. And suddenly they have this diagnosis, bone cysts. So suddenly they think of themselves as not normal or diseased and will return to this. And then all of us have been in clinic trying to reassure families once they hear the word tumor or they hear hole in the bone and they think of tumor is they suddenly think of malignancy. So there's lots of reasons why simple bone cysts uh, are uh, problematic for children and families. So I'm gonna return to this in a second when we get to the second talk. Uh, this is the what used to be called the International Classification of Impairment, Disability and Handicap and is now called the International Classification of Functioning. But I wanna talk about this box, which is impairment. So uh, Andreas told you about some of the theories. Is this an abnormality, a genetic abnormality that leads to some imbalance in, um, in prostaglandins? Is this something to do with the venous function and, and impairment? Is this some activity, bone activity? We don't really know, but there's some underlying disease that results in impairment, which is, which is defined as abnormality in structure or function. So this bone cyst causes the bone to expand, the wall to thin, and predispose to fracture. So this is what we do all the time in orthopedics. We focus on the impairment. How do we quantify that and how can we treat it? So I'm gonna to shift to the topic of my talk, which is reliability. Once we have a measure, and you've heard these tombs, and I'm sure you've seen this schematic, is we want it to be reliable and valid. And this is just a way of illustrating, if our aim is to have a reliable and valid measure, we want with our arrows to hit the center of the bullseye. And in this case, none of the arrows have come even close to the bullseye, so it's neither reliable or valid. So a basic premise is we want our measure to be reliable. If you step on the, on the scales in the bathroom and every time the weight differs by 50 or 60 pounds, those are not good bathroom scales. If you step on those scales and every single time you get exactly the same measure, it's reliable. It doesn't tell you it's, it's true weight, but at least we know it's reliable. So what are the kinds of things we measure in uh, bone cysts? Well, you heard about cyst healing and I'll return to this or show you in a second. We're also interested in some of the radiographic measures. So cyst healing is an impairment measure, but we also are interested in some of these things which relate to the risk of fracture. And one of the things we found in this previous trial is the size of the cyst definitely predicts the risk of fracture, really big cysts are more likely to fracture. So that prompted us to look at this interrelator reliability. And I've talked to you about outcomes. This is the coal modification of the near. It's also four grades. And this would be an evident, clearly seen um, cyst in the diaphysis. Here it's starting to opacify. It's getting a little cloudy inside. Here you can just see a bit of the outlines. This is grade three. 
And then finally in grade four, it's pretty much disappeared. So that's the four grade system. Um, there's the near, and this is the coal modification used to say, okay, the cyst is, is fully there or it's fully healed. Turns out an enormous number of things have been measured in simple bone cysts. Some of them are diagnostic. Some of them are prognostic. Is there a risk of fracture? Is there a risk of healing? And some of them are uh, outcomes. And, and you've heard about the cyst index. Um, this was developed by Andre Kalin and Dean McEwen. And it's basically highly correlated with the size of the uh, cyst. And sure enough, as you've heard, a large cyst is more likely to heal than a, um, a smaller cyst. So, fracture. To fracture, sorry, to fracture. Yes, thank you. So we were interested in all these things. I'm not going to take you through all of the measures, but what we did is we got a group of radiologists and orthopedic surgeons to measure a bunch of x-rays and said, okay, go off and measure all these things. And we had the same radiologist six weeks apart measure the same x-rays. And we looked at the difference between the two radio, the radiologist and the orthopedic surgeons themselves and then against each other. And what you might imagine is we found pretty significant variability. So what did we do? Well, we sat down with the radiologist and said, how do you measure the area of assist? How do you measure scalloping? How do you measure the outcome? And we created this kind of how-to guide, how to grade radi uh, radiographic features in simple bone cyst. And what you might suspect, and very pleasingly, is we found a substantial increase in, in the reliability with a standardized approach. It kind of makes sense, but what you find often in the orthopedic literature is someone says, well, scalloping predisposes to fracture, but they don't actually tell you what that means. So what we learned in this research was the standardized approach was very useful and that we created a how-to guide to measure these radiographs. To come to the question of the cyst index, we found the reliability, in fact, was pretty good, particularly after we standardized the method. Um, the, the metric is not important. It's called the interclass correlation coefficient, but it's 0.84, and that's pretty, pretty good. I agreed with virtually everything that Andrea said, but on the cyst index, we haven't found it very good at differentiating those who heal and don't heal. And this is work done by Suzanne Yandow, and she found what we found is while clearly there's a relationship, the bigger the cysts, there is of risk, there's some very small cysts that fracture, and there's many large cysts that don't fracture. So while there's a relationship, it doesn't seem to be very good at giving us the kind of prognostic certainty that would allow us to decide who to treat and not to treat. So I've, I, I said I would leave you with some practical tips. The most important is that there are no radiographic features that seem to reliably, uh, that validly, they're reliable, but they don't validly predict the risk of fracture. But this one from uh, Brian Schneider's group that did a quantitative CT seemed to be pretty good. 97% uh, specificity versus plain radiographs, only 12%. But as was uh, suggested, it does involve ionizing radiation. So conclusion from my first talk, explicit criteria for simple bone cyst parameters used in their assessment demonstrated improved and substantial interreliability, and that is a very reassuring finding. However, the downside is plain radiographs seem to have little value in predicting the risk of fracture. Maybe CT is the way to go. I'm gonna keep going, so I will stop that talk and go to my next yes, one. Just go on with the next talk, please. Great. So, get this to full screen. So, to remind you, prolong life, improve function, restore function, prevent future decline in function. It's pretty clear function is important in what we do in orthopedics, both in adults and children. There is a bit of a question though, whose outcomes do you wanna look at? The surgeon, the patient, the family of society. And I think all of you have heard of PROMS, 
patient reported outcome measures, recognizing that there's been a shift certainly in my professional career from looking at outcomes which were important to surgeons, such as what they saw in x-rays, to beginning to understand what is important to patients and families. So returning to this concept of the international classification of functioning, you start with a disease, some abnormality, be it genetic or otherwise, that results in impairment, abnormality in structure or function, which leads to what used to be called disability, now called activity limitation, or what used to be called handicap and was called role function. So this is the PROMS movement, which is we're interested in the things that patients can't do. They can't run, they can't jump, they can't play. And we're interested in the role, which for adults is going uh, to work, and for children is going to school and playing. So understanding this gives us a better sense of the implications of the diseases and whether we make a meaningful improvement with our treatment. So again, just to give you some terms, there is disease specific health status. Is there a specific outcome measure for bone cysts? No, there isn't. What you might hear is generic health status or functional status measures. And there are a bunch of these now in pediatric orthopedics. One of them we developed is called the activity scales for kids. Um, um, the CDC um, has a new uh, measure for uh, children. And then quality of life, which looks not just at the disease and how the disease affects, but the entirety of what they do. We spend a lot of time in orthopedics talking about either disease specific measures or generic uh, measures. You heard about this trial that we did looking at two intralesional injections for simple bone cysts. And disappointingly, we found that neither one was very good at healing bone cysts. And remember, this was done two years after treatment it was done blinded to treatment, and it was done by radiologists, not by um, uh, treating uh, surgeons who might be uh, more generous in determining healing uh, than otherwise. We looked at additional fractures. Again, about 30%, between 20 and 30% refracture, but no, no difference. But we we're also interested in function, activity scales, and pain. Now there was no difference. And in fact, interestingly, we found very low levels of pain and very high levels of functioning. So that caused us to think, what's going on here uh, with these children? So what we did is um, um, we uh, looked at 130 children. We had them complete this activity scales for kids, which is a physical function measure. But then we went back and sat down with 10 children and their families and said, what's really going on with your function? How are you doing? And similar to the trial, what we found is 35% were 100%, scored 100% on the ASK score. And when we asked children, 65%, I have no medical needs. So in fact, two thirds really said, eh, I don't see having a bone cyst as a chronic disease. And in fact, when we asked children about their sports, in fact, most of them were doing sports. But Pretty much all of these children were very cautious during their play. And while they participated, it was on their mind the whole time. And the other thing which is really interesting is while the children didn't see themselves as sick, they said they weren't normal. And in fact, when they had surgery, they saw themselves as returning uh, to normal. So this led us to conclude that um, physical function measures give you some sense, but probably don't fully characterize what's going on in this is uh, consistent with what Andrea said, it affects children's and families' perceptions. And maybe we need in orthopedics to think more about illness perception scores, as well as just whether they can run and jump. So the conclusion was surgeons need multiple forms of measurements. So surgeons wanna look at x-rays, patients wanna get um, complete physical function scores. We also need to talk to children and families and say, how you're doing. We know that proms are most important uh, to patients. Um, Simple bone cyst, perhaps a little bit surprising, do not have a big effect on function, but children don't seem normal. And even prompts for physical function don't tell the whole story. So I'll stop there and look forward to cases and questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. We now really have a lot of useful inf information. Uh, maybe we have even more questions 
then we got answers. But I think instead of uh, asking questions now, we just go on to the cases and maybe during the case presentations, we will have uh, questions that we can discuss. So, so should I, I ask Manish to, to present his cases. So let me just go over to this first case. This is a five-year-old boy. These are x-rays uh, from September 2015 when he first had symptoms and the x-ray showed a fracture. At this time, he was seen by his local orthopedic surgeon who put him into a hip spica cast. And in a month's time, this is what the x-ray looked like. It looked like this cyst was healing. Now in uh, three months from the time of his fracture, it looks like the cyst has actually not healed. Uh, it's still there. At that time, the surgeon got uh, CTs as well as uh, his MRs done. And so my question now to the panel is, uh, what, what would you recommend at this stage? Yes. Well, Jim, what would you do in that case? So um, we uh, would treat the child uh, with an undisplaced fracture like this to get the cyst to heal first. So we would not embark on immediate uh, treatment. Um, internal fixation in these fractures is very difficult because they're so close to the growth plate. While you can cross the growth plate with smooth fixation, you always do something with the uh, great trepidation because you don't want to secondarily cause a uh, growth arrest. So um, we have a lower threshold for advising treatment uh, in uh, children uh, with a cyst in the lower extremity. Uh, we engage in a conversation with the family that uh, we believe the cyst will not heal uh, because of the fracture, that um, the child's probably predisposed to further uh, fractures. Um, we don't see avascular necrosis um, associated with these fractures, uh, but if they're displaced, as I said, they become very complicated. And so we would have, we would very much encourage uh, the family towards a treatment. Uh, we're a little more invasive uh, than uh, was suggested. We believe that a, uh, in fact, we're doing a clinical trial now. We've got 120 patients enrolled across the world uh, looking at surgical treatment, uh, we would do um, through a small, relatively small window, a surgical curettage, both curetting the lining, but also breaking down the wall. This seems to be important. Um, there is a, uh, a somewhat, um, there's a rim that you actually have to physically break through, opening up the medullary canal. And then in the trial, we're looking at a uh, bone, um, uh, a VTOS, which is a, is a firm, a hard bone substitute. Uh, we've been fearful to use the liquid. The advantage of the liquid, of course, is it's easier to fill the entire cavity, but uh, we've been very nervous because of the case reports of the liquid cement getting into the uh, venous system. So um, as I say, we've got this trial ongoing. So uh, if the family was absolutely resistant, of course, we would accept their, uh, their decision, but we would uh, do uh, recommend a surgical curatage, break down the uh, bony wall. And then, um, as I say, we've got this trial ongoing of whether you need to um, uh, put a bone uh, substitute in there. And the one we've used is VTOS, uh, which happens to be uh, the biggest selling bone substitute, at least in North America, but it's also sold in uh, Europe. It's not available in India, unfortunately, uh, because we wanted to include Indian sites, but uh, uh, that's what we would do. And you would not, not do an internal fixation? No, we would not do an internal fixation. So we would use protective weight bearing and depending on the age and the child, we might put them in a hip spica for a month. Um, you know, this child's rated right the, the age at which crutches uh, are possible. But you know, you make kind of a qualitative assessment. I don't think after a bone cyst, particularly if you put a little hole in the wall, is structurally sound, you can let them go unprotected. So uh, I, I can't give you an absolute, but we would certainly be happy 
putting the child in a spica for a period of time and then protect it weight bearing till we saw more healing. Andreas, what would you do? Yes, I had a similar case like this, uh, treated it with, uh, as uh, Jim said, <laughs> cyst aspiration and um, I wouldn't go so aggressive. So I do my percutaneous cyst aspiration, fill it up with cement and I put it in for six weeks in the hip spiker. And after that, I let her walk, uh, same age, all about that. And she just struggled and she did a fracture again. And that's why I usually would go a little bit more aggressive. And I think I would go for a percutaneous cyst aspiration, fill it up with a, with a bone cement to stabilize it and additional stabilization with uh, private nails or with, with, with the, with a, with a, a proximal patriotic hip plate, which is yeah. available with a 140 degrees in this age and normally after a year. And you see the stematophysial still good bone. You don't have to go tilt to the growth plate. And I think this will provide enough stability. So I would be a little bit more aggressive in regard of this um, of the stabilization and um, but in a similar way and not making an open curatage or like this. But I, I think in this case you have a good bone adjacent to the to the, the epiphyseal plate. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, at the metaphyseal site, you have a very strong bone, actually. And if you yeah. put elastic nails, they usually hold quite well in such a case. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a thing of experience. And I think, as you said, but uh, you have to be careful and make sure you don't push it. But as, as I agree with you, the metaphyseal part seems to be very strong. And there you have enough holding. So I think I would go with uh, elastic nails plus uh, bone cement. Yeah. Okay, let's go on with Manish. So they came to me at this time and, and I recommended surgery because I was a little worried that uh, he was yeah. a active boy and he would fracture again. So I recommended uh, surgery, but the parents didn't want surgery. So uh, again, this is now uh, a year after he first fractured, it looks the same, although it looks like the wall is now much better than what it was before. Now, this is again another year later. And at this time, the cyst is still there. It looks the same size, maybe a little bigger. There's a little expansion of bone. So again, the same question now. Uh, he's still a little symptomatic. He's still limping a little bit. Uh, do we offer him surgery? So um, uh, while you say it, the cyst itself looks the same, um, it looks like it's moving away from the plate. So you now yes. have a much greater uh, level of uh, fixation. So, um, uh, you know, the previous, uh, both the uh, intramedullary nail and, and the hip plate uh, question of whether there was enough metaphyseal bone, now there clearly is, but I would say the question is exactly the same. He's still mm -hmm. at risk of fracture. Uh, but I would say my prediction would have been based on the cyst size. Uh, I bet that the Kalin index would have indicated that it would refracture. <laughs> and here it is not having refractured, although the ongoing pain suggests that he perhaps has microfractures. So I think the conversation uh, is the same. <laughs> Certainly after one fracture, we, sign, we find many families are like, well, it happened once. It looks like it's healed. They'll be okay. It's with the second fracture often that they go, oh, now we really have to do something. The only problem is, is you hope the second fracture is not uh, hugely displaced. But in this case, I think internal fixation would be much more confidently inserted. Question to Jim and to Andreas. Do you agree that the fracture does not promote healing? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well, it, in my experience, actually, uh, one in three uh, patients healed with a fracture. And, and this was both in the upper limbs as well as uh, in the diaphysis of the femur. So uh, well, maybe it's got something to do with the water um, they drink. Um, in, uh, in our practice. <laughs> this goes back to Nier's original paper, uh, which I think might have been 20%. Um, uh, in our trial, um, after, virtually all of them presented with a fracture or a microfracture. Um, and uh, even those who waited, none of them healed spontaneously. So it's uh, good for you, but uh, that's not 
the general world. No, so I have, I a, have question. a question to the faculty. Um, we heard that the cyst index is still the best predictor of, of fracture risk. How is it with the distance to the to the epiphyseal plate? Is that something that we can use for assessing the risk? I mean, here we have a distance from of about three centimeters to the epiphyseal plate. Is that a good sign? I mean. I still think it's 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 the size of the cyst itself which would worried me as it Jim already analyzed and um, as we say is it an active or is it a this is a latent cyst of course but um, I think uh, I would be with the say I'm now now with Jim absolutely the same and as uh, it's it was great to hear from Jim yeah it's often they have a first fracture and you can't get it really convinced them. But when the second fracture happens, the parents are on your on your level and they want to have the operation. That's also my experience. And um, I mean, it is depending. We don't know something about this kid here. We, we don't know about activity. It seems to be the soft tissue is quite big. So is it a little princess? Is it a little whatever? And he probably has... We don't know actually about this, so we only look to x-rays. And I think to make a decision, it's important to see the psychosocial situation. You see the social situation of the patient, and then maybe it's a better discussion about treatments. However, I still would go for the same as Jim now also said. Andreas, I, I wanted to have, make a more uh, fundamental uh, question. Uh, does a cyst always start at this epiphyseal plate first part of the question and second part of the question why there is absolutely no research on the function of the epiphyseal plate uh, concerning the, the origin of the cyst we, we, we actually don't know when we, we actually don't know the first issue you're bringing up because it's an incidental finding and if they fractured, you haven't seen pictures before. So I think, yeah, as it, getting back to the natural history, I think they started the epiphysis and then goes down. But actually, you're right. You, you, we actually don't know about that. Tim, do you, do you know something about that? <laughs> I was hoping for the answer um, <laughs> from uh, Andreas. Um, <laughs> So clearly there are some cysts uh, which are proximate to the plate and the plate grows away from the cyst. So clearly there are some that start juxta uh, physial, um, but you know, there, I, I've seen cysts in the mid diaphysis, um, which clearly can't have been uh, juxta physial. And, you know, um, I think that the uh, calcaneal uh, cysts are probably the same disease. But of course, they don't have a growth plate. So um, I, I don't have your answer. Uh, some people have hypothesized that it is something related to aberrant, uh, that it origins from some aberrant of growth, some cells, uh, you know, break off and, and cause problems. But uh, I have no idea. Okay. So one more question where we have no answer. But let's go on with Manish. Yes, so, so again, uh, I think we offered surgery and they again declined surgery because the child actually didn't have pain. He was limping a little bit, but didn't have pain, was fairly active. And, and the parents said that we would like to watch because the first time also he healed after the fracture and, and he's not had a second fracture yet. So an MRI was done. It doesn't look like it has healed at all, but they still refused surgery. Yeah. And then they came with this fracture. Bingo. So again, now my question is, now the bone stock is, is much poorer. I mean, you can see how thin that bone is now. How do we handle this? Yeah. Tim, what would you do? So we would um, treat this um, in the acute phase, um, uh, do a small open um, um, 
curettage, uh, curette out, uh, open up the cyst lining. Um, you know, it, uh, um, flexible nails um, are um, attractive. This would need a pretty long hip plate, which could be done. You'd end up with e even, you know, you'd end up with a much bigger incision. So I think I would use flexible nails, uh, but a small open to curette it out and uh, flexible nails up into, uh, right up into that uh, metaphyseal region. Jim, just yes, continuous. I, I agree with you. Flexible nails would be the option. But when you're coming up with the flexible nails, you interrupt this uh, cortical chamber here, and you have a fluid and out fluid drainage. Do you think this could be sometimes enough? With my small experience with that, because uh, so why you want to open and cure it again? Because you come with the nails up, you drainage it the long intramedullary uh, space. And I would go only for closed reduction and put uh, elastic nails in. You know, Andreas, you may be absolutely right. Um, another namesake of yours, Andreas Roposh, um, was the person who first, I think, uh, put out a case series. He did not open the cysts. Uh, he had some persistent cysts and at least one refracture around the cyst uh, with the nails in place. So I have no idea whether a small open uh, curetting the lining uh, further disruption is necessary. And you may be absolutely right. What I'm proposing may add nothing, but um, we've just we've not been uh, completely confident that the flexible nails is enough, and that's why we've done a small open. Uh, you know, you only need about maybe two centimeters, uh, get the curette in, mm. uh, scrape, 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 puncture down, a <laughs> uh, little more careful going up, obviously, and then uh, pass the flexible nails. Yeah. Well, the drainage is, uh, again, the concept where we don't really have good answers. In the past, there was a concept to put a, a screw, uh, a cannulated screw into the cyst to drain it, but it obviously doesn't work. So uh, we don't really know whether this is a good concept. But certainly stabilization is necessary here. And, and we still have enough bone stock at the metaphysis. So I think it can be stabilized. But technically, it's not easy with such a fracture and the big cyst. Yeah, so, so I involved a pediatric orthopedic surgeon and asked him the same question is whether we could do this with flexible nails. And he wasn't sure whether we'll get enough stability. And considering that he's been going on for two years and not healing, we thought it's a good idea to uh, curate the lining at least and, and get him stabilized. So he put this kind of a nail, I mean, the, uh, a telescopic nail, and uh, we put an allograft inside uh, from the open. I mean, it, it, it was all open up, so it was not difficult to uh, put in the allograft there. And we put in a plate for the rotational stability and to maintain the alignment. And it, it, and it, it, it has healed up well. And uh, I mean, he's gone back to his full function now on that. So the whole question was, I think uh, uh, we, we probably could have avoided all this surgery. And as I said, is that question was whether we could have done a percutaneous uh, curettage with the injection of a bone substitute or an allograft at that time and, and maybe prevented a fracture like this yeah. and avoided implants. I mean, the first thing when he had the fracture, I mean, how often in a neck femur, would you advise against surgery or just treatment in a hip spiker versus actually stabilizing or at least doing something so that the cyst doesn't increase and cause a fracture was my question. Because in the yes. human yeah. human, even if the child had a fracture, the fracture heals if you immobilize them. The cyst may not heal. It takes a long time to heal, but they, they don't become very symptomatic once the fracture heals. And they're able to go on with their schooling and, and some of their activities. We find that for a long time, the cyst has not healed completely. And that may be the reason why we see all this literature reporting very poor rates of healing even after a fracture. But, but if you look at the patient's uh, function, they are completely asymptomatic. They've got full movements. They're going to school. They're participating in sport, in the humerus. But I don't know whether the femur should be treated completely differently compared to the proximal humerus. 
Manish, do you, it is nice to see now a standing view because I was expected, but you have already a significant leg length discrepancy in this patient, isn't it? Uh, no, actually, we measured him. He, this this is the way the X-ray was taken. Uh, I, he's not come because of this COVID. I haven't seen him for a year and a half now. And I just uh, spoke to his father uh, a, a week ago. And he says he's absolutely fine. There's no leg length discrepancy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's written, it's a standing X-ray. Yeah. Whatever that means. It looks like a leg length discrepancy, but of course, if the knee is flexed, then we can't tell. Yes, and this nail crosses the uh, distal yeah. physis. Does, yeah. does it not? Yeah. It does. It does. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that it's makes dangerous. sense in uh, osteogenesis imperfecta, but I'm always worried about uh, yeah. nails yeah. like this in otherwise benign conditions. So I, I hope it's not a, a, a growth arrested doesn't look but your your the threads are right across the plate um ideally they should be fully in the metaphysis so um that's a bit of a worry yeah yeah okay that's an interesting case yeah. do you want to present present your second case will let hitesh present his case first oh or yes yes hitesh do you you present your case yes Okay, thank you. Uh, and the screen is visible? Yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I am presenting the case in a adolescent girl, actually 14-year-old girl presented with the left and right side groin pain since almost six months. The clinical range of motion was normal. And she was just complaining the pain and the limp. So uh, we took the, the frog lateral x-ray, the full length x-ray, and we investigated in terms of the MR. Uh, in the coronal cut, horizontal cut, we can see the, the cystic fluid in the T2 and in case of the, it was decided that it is a simple bone cyst. So the, the my question to the, all the panelists, how frequently, as the Andrea has already mentioned in his series, he see the 15% of the adult patient he do see the cyst, but how frequently all of us will see the cyst in adolescent or the skeletal mature patient, and how do we manage? Andreas, you want yes. to um, answer? Inesh, can you go back? I, I, I'm on, I must have a little bit of doubt about if it's really a simple bone cyst. And I would recommend, an, um, uh, I would recommend, I have seen a fluid level in one of the papers, uh, images, and I would really recommend a biopsy for that lesion. I'm not sure if here, yeah, you see it here, fluid level in the middle of the MRI when he's lying. So I'm not sure if it's really, it looks a little bit, yeah. Yes, uh, we did biopsy and yes. it was not ABC, it was SBC, the good. simple concept, yes. Okay, good. That, that would be the first decision in that case. And in this case, I mean, she has already a solid, structure in the middle of the femur it looks like here started to reossify and you told me she's in pain yes yeah i mean in this case i would go uh, because the physis is closed the head seems to be have a good bone stock and actually the lateral i think I would go for an operation doing a curettage of it and putting a proximal hip plate on to make sure she doesn't get fractured. Yeah. And place the screws in the physis because the epiphysis is closed. So you can put the screws long till in the head. You get more stability. And yeah, I wouldn't go for that. And would you put bone in it? 
Um, no, I would just put some substitute in, like uh, bone cement. Yeah. yeah. Jim, what would you do? Like a, 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 a unicameral bone cyst, which has uh, healed partially. And that's yes. the reason why you have that uh, ledger. Yes. Exactly. But this is one of this this is one of these residual cysts you have, and this is not so rare. I, I was surprised. Uh, you know, in in the older books, it stands, yeah, the cyst will recover, they will re it, no problem. But this is not true. I, I think in my case, I have already seen about, I would say about 15% we have residual cyst in age over 20. And I'm sure this will stay like it is. So she will get a problem in two, three years. And if she is a sportive, active patient, I would stabilize her, getting rid of the fluid, getting some substitute in and stabilize that, of course. Jim, what would you do? Yeah, so uh, the reason that we say uh, bone cyst uh, heal with age is because pediatric orthopedic surgeons <laughs> hand the patient off at age 18 and tell them everything will be fine. Uh, we actually published in JPO uh, the long-term follow-up on all of the patients in that randomized clinical trial. And in fact, 80% of the cysts uh, persisted into the young adulthood. Um, oh. So I think the cysts, I think it's a myth that these cysts necessarily uh, go yeah. away. Uh, this is a little atypical in appearance. So I think a biopsy was absolutely uh, yeah. the right thing to do. Uh, it does appear that the risk of fracture, however, does drop with age. And I think that's why we see this so infrequently um, in adults because the cysts are asymptomatic. Given that she has pain, because um, many of the times these are asymptomatic, you know, simply seen on follow-up. So I would have a discussion with her, um, but I think she is at risk. I just can't tell her what that risk is. Uh, but with ongoing pain, we'd be much more likely to try and uh, stabilize the cyst exactly as been said. We would, uh, you know, curatage hip plate and uh, we would use a bone substitute yep. of some kind. Uh, but if she, uh, if her symptoms were minimal and she was relatively inactive and willing to accept a small uh, risk of, fr of a fracture, and I can't quantitate that, but a very small risk, then I would let her go. So those would be the it would involve a lot of discussion uh, with her and a good sense of how bad her symptoms are now. So if she's asymptomatic, I'd lean against doing something, but with symptoms, I would lean towards exactly as Andreas has said. I have a question. Anish, yes. How, how much quantity of bone substitute can you use safely? Is there a limit? Because this much volume would require a very large amount of a bone substitute. Probably even 30 grams, 40 grams, probably. Yeah. And is that safe? And how expensive would that be? <laughs> it will be very expensive. But so long the insurance paid, I'm happy. But I agree with you, Manish. It could be a, as you have different insurance systems. Um, uh, however, as Fritz already pointed out, maybe if you don't have the coverage of some expensive medication, you find alternative possibility taking the bone marrow of the pelvis or using the using the um, the narrow that the marrow of the femur with a with a reaming uh, system on the, on that with the reamers you can aspirate the bone marrow from the femur. So you have different options to keep it uh, cheap. So um, and probably. I think, as we know, sometimes you need just a little bit. You don't have to really impact or the full pack the cyst, particularly if you are willing to do a stable osteosynthesis and uh, you're getting the fluid out. I think it, there's a big chance that this cyst will recover. And taking into account still that she's quite close to the physis and could be active. Okay, I think we should go on. Hey, Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, actually, we thought about the discuss with the family and they were ready for the surgery. So that was a, not an issue, but the issue was that what kind of fixation and as money is brought out that the amount of the bone graft or the, the bone substitute will be too much. So we thought about percutaneous, the curative 
and fix with the, the titanoplastic nail and preventing the pathological fracture on the neck we have added with the screw. And that was done uh, without opening or anything except that needle beak and curated the wall. And that was the, the three months follow up and that it was looking it better. The six months follow up and that is that the one year follow up. So the, she was absolutely asymptomatic and she was able to do the, all the activity without any other issue. And as the doctor the site mentioned very before that, the simple bonds doesn't be better with the age and he has he's published the long-term result. And he's saying that none of them or 87% adult did heal at the skeletal maturity. And another paper from Israel that said that we need to fix with the internal fixation for the adolescent or adult group always. Any comment? Yeah, you sure. Sure. Considering your fixation, I mean, how long did you immobilize her? No immobilization. So no, no, just no. off weight bearing? Yes, off weight bearing for the six weeks. And we started six weeks off weight bearing. Yeah. yeah, I think you found a very good solution. Yes. I knew that in Manipal you do good solutions. Thank you. So I think we have time for one more case. Manish, you, you okay. want to present one more case? Yes, sure. Uh, Thank you. So this is a 10-year-old boy who presented with some pain and some restriction of movements at his uh, shoulder, particularly the terminal movements were painful and a little restricted. These were what his x-rays, uh, I mean, what does it look like? Is it, is it an aneurysmal bone cyst or is it an, uh, a unicameral bone? I can tell you. Jim, what do you think? Well, uh, Andreas is the Do we the need to turn on x-rays or do we need uh, MRI? To Right, so um, Andreas is the tumor surgeon. Uh, some people say when the cyst exceeds the width of yeah. the um, associated physis, you need to be really worried about an ABC. Yeah. This to me yeah. looks like an ABC. I'd be very hesitant to treat this. You know, many times an SBC is self-evident from the films, but in this case, uh, this yeah. looks to me like an ABC. Um, you could get some MRI, but I think it's going to require a small biopsy. And usually when you go in, you find it fully blood filled and it's pretty obvious that that's what it is. I would tell you, yeah. this is a complicated one to treat because it is so close to the growth plate. So yeah. curetting is going to be really difficult here, but I think this is, I, I would bet it's an ABC. I'm not hundred percent sure, but I would bet it's ABC. Yeah. Yeah. Anish, but uh, what do you think? Do you think that the growth plate is already affected by the yeah. cyst? See it here. There's some osteolytic parts already. Or there's an interruption of the physis here, probably. It's hard to say an X-ray, but I think here, and also I have the feeling here. But the MRI will show here as exactly. You see now the MRI. I mean, we. I would do also see sure of sure an MRI and as as well, you said. Here you can clearly yeah. see that yeah. there is a. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it looks like it's a single cyst. It's a, it's a unilocular thing with a single fluid level. And that's the contrast picture. Now, what is, what is actually happening at the group plate? I, I, I don't know what is... Uh, there, there's a lot of enhancing area there. Is it because it's the group plate or uh, do you use, sometimes see it in a UBC? Or is this an ABC still? I think this is an ABC. Uh, see, me too. I would do a biopsy. I, I have I'm... seen a, um, a horizontal um, yeah, blood fluid level. A level at one of the, the other MRIs. So yes. A biopsy, and, and, and they said this is a, a simple bone cyst. I mean, uh, and when, in fact, we got just pink fluid. We didn't even get oh. blood inside the cyst. And that looked like something like a, a, a simple bone cyst contaminated with some kind of uh, bleeding inside, maybe because of a micro fracture. But uh, it, it didn't look like a UBC. And 
there was a very thick lining when we used the needle to try and scrape the wall to give it to the uh, pathologist in frozen section and and they said this looks like a simple bone cyst and they asked me suppose it's an aneurysmal bone cyst is your treatment going to change so uh, is the, I, is the, was the usp6 immunohistochemical negative pardon did they make an immunohistochemy no this uh, uh, not not on this they asked whether we need to do it and we didn't at this time okay. I mean, if it's a simple bone cyst or even an aneurysmal bone cyst I, I generally would not do anything more than this, except uh, unless it keeps increasing in size. And this actually, after the biopsy, I mean, we, we really didn't curate this. All I did was to scrape uh, the mm -hmm. wall with the needle when I did the biopsy to get the lining so that the pathologist can tell me what this is. And it started to heal. And, and it went on to uh, completely heal. But there's obviously been some uh, affection of the growth plate by the cyst itself. And, but he, he's, he's completely asymptomatic after this and we didn't really require to do anything. So again, my question is, would not looking at its behavior, do you think this is a, a unicameral bone cyst or do you think it was an aneurysmal bone cyst which is healed? I think this question is not any more important because it healed. Yes. And who, <laughs> the, if you heal, I mean, if you heal the patient, you are right. Uh, I mean, however, and we know also that aneurysmal bone cysts can, yes. can behave, can behave, can behave like this. They also can heal. Yeah. Yeah. Aneurysmal bone cysts yeah. can also heal. So uh, spontaneous. <laughs> yeah. So it, uh, we uh, can't uh, really uh, answer the question. So my question is, how does the pathologist differentiate? I mean, how, how do you, oh. if I really wanted to know, how do I get the differentiation? Yeah. We is there any histochemistry you asked, is, is it really going to help me? Yeah. We usually do an immunostichomy with USP6. And if this is positive, you are you have the proof of an anosmal bone cyst. Yeah, because there, we don't there is have a... that uh, uh, antibody with us. Yeah, that's... That's the, yeah, and, that's what we do. And they also have a genetic anomaly, but aneurysmal yeah. bone cysts. So you yeah. can find it like this also. Yeah, exactly. Um, yes, I, I think have, looking uh, at this case, I think it's more likely that this was a unicameral bone cyst rather than a ABC, but you can't really tell for sure. How often do you see an aneurysmal bone cyst with a single fluid level, a single uh, Cavity. Sure. Oh, Can I add two things, Fritz? Yes, Jim. Uh, um, I saw one MRI where I thought I saw a level. There was a single level. Yes. yes. And uh, I mean. So, can I just comment that there is significant deformity in the physis? Yes. Um, and that's caused deformity in uh, the femoral or the humeral head. Um, obviously, it's too big to consider a resection. And I can't remember how old the child was, but there is still residual plate laterally. And you always have to be worried about further worsening of a, um, I'm not sure you can't call it a coxivera, whatever the proximal humeral varus is. <laughs> and, and the second thing is, and I've seen this in two children, they end up with a really big limb length discrepancy. Um, now that may be less important in a child. I think in this case, the diagnosis at this point is not so important. I don't know whether it was an ABC or a UBC, but it doesn't really matter. But I'm, I would be more worried about any further deformity uh, because uh, the humeral head is undergone quite a bit of a change in its orientation. And that usually results in a decrease in abduction of the shoulder. And I'd be worried about the limb length uh, just to advise the child that they may end up with quite a significant limb length. Okay. And on the X-ray, it also looks like a rather shortened. Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, Jim, do you would do an epiphysidasis to uh, avoid deformity and probably do a double or do a lengthening of the humor, humerus with, let's say, in, in tw twice the time. So with first first with a external fixator and then later on with a, with a nail. What do you think, Jim? So I would have done a percutaneous uh, uh, yeah. pyphysiodesis just to yes. prevent further deformer exactly. early on. 
And mm. then in terms of upper extremity unilateral um, uh, humeral lengthening, it's totally dependent on the family's uh, issues. Yep. Some uh, are very upset by, you know, it's often four, five, six centimeters difference. Uh, but then there are other families who hear about it and they're like, we don't want anything to do with it. So uh, it's a family choice, but I definitely yeah. would want to prevent further deformity. Exactly. Uh, Me too. I think these were very interesting cases, and I thank Manish and Hitesh for their very good cases. And I think we could continue to discuss a lot, but it's time to end the session uh, precisely at uh, in Europe, seven o'clock, whatever it is in India. And I thank uh, all the participants. Uh, uh, who uh, contributed to this interesting se session. Thank you very much. Diren, you want to add something? Yes, uh, I will request Sandeep to uh, pass a vote of thanks. Sandeep. Yes, sir. So uh, at the outset, uh, let me apologize for joining a bit late. And uh, it was a very, very interesting session. And I was really fascinated by Jim Wright's uh, papers and analysis of the patient reported outcomes. That seems to be really the key thing uh, nowadays because we are dealing with a cyst which appears to be benign, but there's no clue why it happens. There is no real uh, hypothesis why it heals and which one is going to heal, at what age it is going to heal. Is it going to heal just by scraping as money showed or you need to really put allografts and go all the way and do the full Monty so we are really clueless about a lot of things. So we will have to take into account what the patient and the family wants as long as we are sure that it's a benign cyst and we can get the child to be pain-free and stabilized. What appears to me is that weight-bearing bones with a KLN index, which is larger than four, probably will need stabilization because they are at risk to refractures. Whether introduction of an implant or a percutaneous method gets it to heal remains to be seen. And as they get older, they seem to be healing a little better. Uh, so with those summary words, I would like to thank Fritz for really conducting the seminar perfectly on time, Jim Wright for his beautiful papers and Dr. Andreas for his comments and insights into the bonuses. And I thank Hitesh and Manish, friends from POSI for those lovely cases. Thank you very much, everybody, and good night. Good night.